It's going to take me a while to find this deck. Oh, take your time. Right. Hi, everyone. It's Metal Connect. Of course, every week we spend time with one of the amazing guests that we had on Saturday, and we get to dive into what they've done with their career, their passions. And this is an just out-of-world experience because how often do you get to hang out with a true astronaut? That's a doctor at the same time. By the way, uh, I'm not sure if you know this, uh, Scott. I was knighted last year. So I was okay. actually knighted. And so my title before my name is Sir, which I never use, Sir Ken. Do you have a title before it? Is it doctor? Do they call you astronaut? Yes. What do you they, got? They call me Hey You. Uh, that's <laughs> uh, no, no, no fancy titles for me, unfortunately. Uh, I just, I mean, I, no one calls me doctor anymore. I'm just, I'm very, very low key and it doesn't really matter. But uh, technically, uh, you know, you, you could call me Dr. Scott, but uh, um, not important for sure. So, so. How, just, it's, everyone just calls you Scott. That's, That's just, it. Scott. I'm just Scott. Just what, Scott. What, is, what is your life today? Just tell us what the average normal day is like for you. Well, I'm sure like everyone in this group, it, every day is, you know, wildly different. Um, you know, obviously the, the curveballs of the, the pandemic and everything else that's going on. But you know, I, I run a tech company uh, that's very dynamic um, and dealing with the, the, the pandemic and the, it, the ramifications to our business model makes it exciting every day. So um, I, I have a growing company. I'm, I'm hiring right now. So bringing on new talent, uh, trying to continue to innovate, stay ahead of the competition. Um, so I'm, I'm on Zoom calls. Uh, you know, like you guys, uh, not just nine to five, but for, it, this is actually past my bedtime. This is nine o'clock here in, in central time. But uh, yeah, I'm on Zoom calls sometimes until 11 o'clock at night. But I, I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, inventing stuff and, and working with, uh, with great people, which is really important. And, what is your uh, business? What is the... Yeah, so I... Um, let me show you. Well, I don't yeah. know. Uh, I, th this, is, this is actually just 3D print of our... Uh, our next uh, generation. Actually, it's top secret. I can't even show you that, but um, but uh, it's it's a drone flight control. We actually uh, could not see it because of the good. background covered it up, exactly. so we didn't know what it looked. It looked like a giant penis, to be honest with you. Yes, exactly. Well, the, then you 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 got the uh, the silhouette, and so that it had dramatic effect. But um, let me show you actually uh, our first generation product. And I'll hold it in front of me so you can actually see it. It still looks like a. Uh, male anatomy, if, if you if you really want it to, but uh, um, essentially it puts uh, all of drone flight control in a single hand. And so, you know, if you've ever flown a drone with uh, a traditional controls, which uh, you know, look like this, there are two sticks. Um, this is not how the mind is mapped to the three dimensional world. And so, what we've done is taken a really complex thing, moving a, a fast moving vehicle through three dimensional space, or think about VR or AR. Uh, or surgical robotics where you have to have precision of motion of an asset inside the human body, you want it to be a subconscious act. And what we've done is, is made that kind of motion control subconscious. So, so. But the idea is to consolidate everything into an experience that's basically joystick. It's joystick based, but uh, we can put up to six degrees of freedom of motion. So not just the X, Y, Z or position, but the, the pitch, yaw and roll so uh, we can, uh, and, and we give tactile feedback so you know when you're inputting a command and when you're not, which is kind of our secret sauce. And uh, in so doing, um, I, I, can, I can fly circles around anybody with this thing, and I can really focus on the imagery that I'm out there to capture as opposed to how the hell am I going to get out there? I, I'm a pretty good pilot with, with this thing too, but uh, you know, there, there are times when you get into into a dangerous situation, uh oh, what do I do next? And there's never amb any ambiguity with, uh, with our control system. Would that controller be, because what you just showed was kind of a, a prosumer level type drone. Is that the market you're going after or are you going more government? Uh, well, actually uh, both. Uh, so the, our first generation product is uh, yeah, for the, uh, um, you know, the, the camera drone operator, you know, the weekend warrior going out to shoot their, your kid's soccer game or, uh, you know, to uh, basic cinematographers. But our, our uh, next generation product actually is for the government. Um, you may have heard in the news, but there's been a lot of pushback uh, against uh, Chinese products coming in for a variety of reasons, one of which 
is that uh, in the past, uh, some of these drones have actually sent imagery back to the mothership in some place. And uh, so the, the Department of Interior and other agencies don't trust uh, you know, th these Chinese- You're specifically drones. talking about DJI was doing telemetry they were sending back. DJI and, and perhaps others as well. Yeah. Um, and so there's a, a huge um, renaissance or uh, um, real focus on American companies, American made, you know, can we build these things homegrown? Um, and, and so there are a number of major contracts to support uh, you know, our federal agencies and DOD now. And so we're, we're it, trying to become- tough. But it's tough. I'm a huge drone person. I've, I've, oh. I've gone all the way back. The biggest problem is the, the price and I haven't found anything to where the value is equal to the price, anything that's made in the States. That's the biggest issue. Well, that's changing, uh, but you're, you're exactly right. So DJI has an army of a thousand engineers and they're continuing to do amazing engineering and innovation. Um, however, uh, there, there are a number of upstart companies in this country. Uh, Skydio is one that has some really cool collision avoidance and uh, follow technology that's, that's really disruptive. But, but there are many others now that uh, are going to give them a run for the money. And uh, so for, for us, it's a great opportunity because we want to be the Swiss army knife. We're going to talk. I don't care if you're DJI or Autel or Skydio or, uh, you know, uh, Uber, Uber Air or, you know, any of these uh, urban air uh, mobility kinds of uh, plays that are out there. We want to be your controller. You know, we, we make it simple and intuitive. Um, and so... We're, we're creating APIs for, for everybody so that, you know, you can fly. And it, not only is it intuitive and precise, it's fun. I mean, you feel like you're Luke Skywalker, you know, that scene where he's shooting down the Death Star. You know, you're, you, you've got this uh, precision of control and it, you know, your drone is an extension of your body. So it's, it's really pretty awesome. I'll tell you, if Nolan pops in here, Nolan Bushnell created Atari. I think he'll like your controller a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to talk to him. I'd love <laughs> well, to talk I can to totally set you up on that. So it sounds like your life is just as exciting as it was going back a few decades ago when um, you were doing some crazy stuff. By the way, I love the industry you're in. It's a pretty hot industry. Thank Let's you. go before that. Did you really want to become an astronaut? Was that one of your aspirations when you were younger? Oh, totally. Uh, Ken, uh, Sir Ken, sorry. Excuse me. Pardon me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, actually, since I was a little kid, I, you know, I, my dad worked on the Apollo program when I was a tyke. So I had model rockets and posters on the wall. Um, and I wanted to be the, the Neil Armstrong setting the first boot prints down on Mars. And so that was my, my thing. Uh, that's what I really wanted more than anything in the world. And, uh, and so it didn't quite work out that way. I didn't get to Mars. Maybe, maybe one day I'll get to go, but I wanted to be a part of the program. And, uh, so I, I just uh, kind of, you know, um, nose to the grindstone and, and kept, kept preparing myself with, uh, with skills that I thought would be appropriate for the job. And, uh, you know, NASA liked me, so well, but, it worked but out. Getting, getting to become an astronaut, it's not like the old, was it Starfighter, where you play a video game and the, the, the alien forces out there analyze your video game play and they recruit you in. It's not like that. You, you have to go through a process to become an astronaut. So was the right college? Did you have to pick the right school? Did you have to write the, uh, pick the right programs? How did you design it to become one of the elites? Well, it's a great question. And, and really, there is no formula. Just like anything, you, you, if you say you want to be Steve Jobs, well, you know, there's there's only one Steve Jobs. Uh, there there are, are you know, three or four hundred NASA astronauts in history, so there are a few more of us. Uh, so there are a few more models that I could talk to. Uh, but but that's that's what I did actually. I I, I knew I, where I wanted to go. I found a way in to to meet a couple of physician astronauts because I wanted to become a doctor as well. And I said, well, hey, what did you do? What what was your pathway? I knew I'd have to to chart my own course, but there were some common denominators from the people that I talked to. Um, you know, you needed to be a team player. You needed to be well-rounded in, in science. You needed to be a strong, you know, you needed to be strong at all the things that you did. You couldn't be uh, half-assed about it. And, um, and, and they suggested becoming a pilot and a diver and, and a few other things, um, which I did. And, um, you know, I, I, I was in the right place at the right time. I, I applied, uh, actually earlier than people 
uh, many people thought I should have actually. Um, I was still in my residency training program. You know, after medical school, there's internship and residency, and then you become you know, certified to actually hang a shingle and, and do clinical care. Well, I was still in my residency training, and I thought, NASA's not going to take me seriously because I haven't finished my training yet. But uh, one of my advisors said, you know, throw in your, your application early. You never know. Uh, you'll get some experience, and maybe the next time you'll get selected. And uh, I did that, and I was so relaxed and excited about the job when I took my interview. They said, we, we wouldn't mind spending six months in a can with this guy. Let's hire him right now. And so that was my, that was my ticket right there. But you still had to go through your residency and everything I on top did. of it. I, I, still had, I still had about a year more to go to finish my residency in emergency medicine, but it wasn't important at that point. I had already kind of become a generalist in medicine and uh, I was a team player. I had a lot of science background and other skills and, and uh, they needed me at that point. And so. So you, you didn't go through the military process then? I did not. About uh, half of the astronaut corps are civilian actually. Um, and so uh, the, the kind of the military test pilots that sit in the front of the shuttle or, or will fly the, the actual spacecraft. Uh, although you know, now with SpaceX, it's completely automated. But uh, back in the old days when we had to you know, fly our spaceships with stick and rudder, uh, that the front seaters were military test pilots and then the mission specialists like myself could be, uh, you know, scientists, physicians, engineers. I, I do want to touch about touch upon SpaceX a little later on, but I want to go through this process then. So where were you living and did you relocate to Houston or Florida? Where did you have to relocate to? Yeah, I was living in, in Denver, Colorado, and, and it, it really, uh, it had to be a pretty special job to move from, the, the Colorado Rockies, which is my spiritual home, you know, being a climber and, and loving the mountains and leaving that to, to go to Houston, Texas. But uh, uh, that, that was what was required. So the, the training um, and the job itself is actually based in, in Houston, Texas. And then NASA has 10 uh, centers around the country. So you mentioned the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, out in California there, there's obviously JPL and Edwards and uh, uh, Ames Research Center up in Northern California. Um, so, you know, lots of stuff all over the country, but the two main centers for human spaceflight are the Johnson Space Center in Houston and Kennedy in Florida. And, and you said that the one movie that was the closest depiction was Armageddon. No, I'm kidding. It was the right <laughs> stuff, right? The right stuff was well, the closest no. depiction. Well, actually, uh, Apollo 13. Apollo 13, Apollo that's right. Apollo 13 was the closest depiction of what right. you wanted. They, they filmed a lot of it actually in, uh, in weightlessness um, in a parabolic aircraft we call the Vomit Comet. The vomit but, Comet. I've been on it. Yeah, it's, it's awesome, isn't it? Did you throw up? No, not at all. I, I thought it was pretty cool. I, yeah. I, 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 was, um, I was going to go with Peter Diamantis and oh. uh, with uh, uh, Stephen Hawking. I, I wasn't able to uh -oh. do that one, but God, that would have oh, been cool, God. right? That but, would have been ultimate. Yeah. So as you went through this, you go through the training and of course all the simulations because they put you through all kinds of things to test your body and of course your mind because that's the key it's more the mind than the body if you go back to Gattaca I'm, I'm a movie guy obviously the biggest yeah. problem with him the character in Gattaca was he wasn't perfect he had a lot of issues if you remember the movie so he made it to where he looked like he was a perfect person so he could become an astronaut yeah. Did you have any issues where you were questionable on you as a person? Like, did you have some type of phobia or fear or varicose veins or something that may have potentially <laughs> held you back? Chronic halitosis. No, uh, nothing, nothing pretty serious. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, the, the selection process for me was just kind of fun. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it when, when we got together on, on that Saturday morning session, but I talk about it a lot. There's this, uh, there's this screening a uh, test that they do uh, essentially to find out if you're claustrophobic. And it does weed out people periodically, but they put you in this uh, uh, inflatable ball. It's like the size of a beach ball. They put on heart monitors, uh, you know, uh, EKG electrodes, uh, put on a comm cap, and uh, it's completely dark in there. Uh, they can talk to you. You can talk to them. But 
they, they tell you that it's a de device designed to find out if they could actually transfer astronauts from one stranded shuttle to another. And they just want to uh, get your feedback uh, uh, as to its, its worthiness for space flight. But really, as part of the selection process, they're trying to find out if you go nuts in a, an enclosed in environment. And uh, I fell asleep. Um, so I think I passed the test. But, How long uh, were you in it? I, I have no idea. I, <laughs> I had to shake the, shake the ball to, to wake me up. So I, I did okay. But, um, but, but, uh, but getting back to your question, which is kind of profound, uh, none of us are perfect, right? I mean, all of us have um, weaknesses in terms of uh, uh, skill sets or personality quirks or uh, you know, um, tolerances for various things. And uh, one of the things that uh, is great about crew cohesion, when a team comes together, um, you really find out, uh, you spend months and months with one another, uh, sometimes in stressful environments and simulations and otherwise, and uh, you support each other. And so, you know, people find out that uh, when I get hangry, um, they got to get me something to eat pretty quickly or my, uh, you know, my blood sugar ro rolls low and, and then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very um, you know, limited in terms of my communication skills. And uh, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not ever um, you know, nasty or anything like that, but I just, I, I communicate less and I get you know, more and more focused on, hey, when, when's my next meal coming? And so they always have snacks ready, ready for me. And so that's, that's one of my blind sides, I suppose. It's kind of cool that you know that. My girl's like that too. You guys are just the same, it's weird. <laughs> All right, so let's really now get to that first time. What was your very first launch date? I thought you were going to talk, to me, about, talk nope. to me about first girlfriend, but... No, you already uh, showed us the dildo machine that you made, but no, let's go to the first... What was the date? Uh, it was November 3rd, 1994, and uh, I was a mission specialist uh, number four. I was seated behind the pilot of the space shuttle Atlantis on a mission called STS-66, STS uh, with a mission... Uh, designed wow, around 94 so so wait so this is nine years after the um when when did challenger. yeah challenger blew up in 85 86 Good 86 86 yep. okay 86 so o-rings you know about all the things that oh, yeah. potentially go wrong you're yep. you're you're sitting in a, a potentially something that has already blown up you've already know that this has happened right you're buckled in and it's launch, you know, five, four, three, two, one. And the first thing that goes through your mind, is it the G-force? Is it the sound? What, what's happening? Yeah, so th there's a, an incredible rumble about six seconds before the, uh, the actual launch itself. And it's a water deluge system that, that's draining, you know, uh, your backyard swimming pool, you know, 10 of those a second. You know, it's just a huge amount of water flooding down beneath the, uh, the shuttle in a flame trench so that when the main engines and the SRBs ignite, the solid rocket boosters, they don't blow the shuttle apart and damage the, you know, tear apart the, the launch tower. So uh, it's to attenuate all this incredible, uh, not only uh, thrust, but acoustic uh, energy that could rip apart anything in its uh, um, vicinity. So if you were 800 feet away from the space shuttle, the sound waves themselves would kill you. Uh, so just, just the sound waves, if, if you think about that. So 7 million pounds of thrust to, to leave, uh, uh, leave planet Earth. So uh, you, you hear and feel, it's a visceral experience, this uh, you know, vibration uh, you know, throttling up. And then at T0, it's like, a, it's like a catapult shot off of an aircraft carrier being you know, kicked in the butt at three times, norm, uh, three times your normal body weight or three Gs. And you can't believe anything would accelerate that quickly. And um, what's remarkable is that that acceleration uh, continues for eight and a half minutes. I mean, you're, wow. you're continuing to, to, to move, uh, you know, like the steepest part of the steepest roller coaster you've ever been on, but it keeps on going and going and going. It's just- What kind of G-force are you talking about? So it, it's, I mean, it's, it's not like uh, the, the kind that would pull your face back and, you know, deform your, uh, your body, but uh, three G's is what uh, we throttle back to so that we don't actually rip apart the, the wings or strip off the tiles on the yeah, side. But you're not passing out. That's the whole thing. No, 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 no. You're not, you're not passing out. And, and we train 
in aircraft, we fly aerobatic flight to, to pull G's so that you, you build the tolerance and, and we lift weights, which is a, a great way to- You tighten uh, your legs also, right? Tighten your legs. Now the, the G-force though is actually through the chest. So it's actually pretty comfortable on the way, we call it downhill uh, as opposed to uphill. On, on, your, on your way back to earth, the G-force is from our head down to our toes. And in that situation, we actually wear a G suit that squeezes our belly. And then there are actually uh, devices in our suit that actually squeeze our legs and our calves so that we have enough circulatory perfusion you know, to, to land the shuttle. God, okay, so you, now you're going, you're going eight minutes and you hit that weightless, that real weightlessness, not yeah. something that was simulated on the Vomit Comet. This is real. Did you ever expect it to be the way it was, or was it just, yeah, this is what I expected. This is it. Uh, th there's no way to, to really mentally prepare yourself. And so I, like you had done a, a number of flights on the, the, uh, the vomit comet. So I, I knew what weightlessness felt like. I had trained underwater. I'm a, I'm a big time scuba diver. So I knew what weightlessness w was like and how I would feel. And I, I felt comfortable in, you know, reorienting myself. But uh, there's no way to, to really uh, anticipate the, uh, the spiritual and visceral reaction that you have when you see your home planet from that vantage point for the first time. It's like, oh, yeah. holy crap. Uh, um, you're, we're already over Europe. And, uh, and, and there's our external tank uh, you know, floating outside the window. And you're, my first job was actually to take a bunch of pictures of it to make sure that it, we hadn't had any major damage and. Uh, so I'm, I'm here, I'm, you know, unstrapped really quickly and I'm floating around for the first time, you know, a little bit bumbling around, getting used to the gravity, uh, zero gravity environment and, uh, you know, kicking my pilot in the head and, <laughs> Did you? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you, uh, you're just, uh, overwhelmed, uh, in the, uh, in the magic of it all. Were you the newbie on the, on this? Were you yeah. the so you were the virgin on this flight where all the other guys going, yeah, come on, and the new guy. I mean, <laughs> were, were, they, were they supportive or were they reliving the experience through you? How were they reacting to your experience? That's, that's a really uh, great theme. And actually one of the things I really loved about being the old grizzled veteran you know, on, on later flights is you know, seeing the, the gleam in, in the new folks' eyes. You know, it's actually, it's a little overwhelming if you've ever, you know, worked really hard for something and you finally get to do it, whatever that thing is. Uh, um, you know, for me, you know, uh, you know, training really hard for many years and then finally getting a chance to fly in space or, um, you know, there's some certain experiences in medicine where, oh my God, I'm operating on someone's brain here. This is, this is crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, so to see that uh, sense of uh, excitement, but also um, a little bit of bewilderment and and being overwhelmed because uh, yeah. you you don't want to screw up you know you don't want to uh, you know screw up a, a 10 million dollar experiment or throw the wrong switch that could have you know horrible consequence so that I remember my first flight uh, enjoying it intensely but um, really wanting to go up as again as quickly as I could because I knew I was going to feel good uh, I had no health issues. I knew I'd perform well. And, um, and so with each subsequent mission, I was able to absorb more of the experience and uh, it got more and more fun. I, I wonder if, cause you're a worker up there. Your function right. is to work. So someone like a Tito that may have paid $24 million to go up and experience that, he's kind of in the way, isn't he? Well, you know, I, I don't want to malign those guys. Um, I, I get it, but you know what I'm saying. If your function is to work, to do all these projects and experiments, they're there as just a tourist. That's well, they, they were. Uh, I think, it, well, two things I would suggest to you, Sir Ken, is that uh, one is it's an important next step uh, in, uh, in uh, human exploration and in the advancement of, uh, you know, an industry. So this is kind of the, 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 the barnstorming era of, of this new industry. But, you know, many of those guys, you know, uh, um, like uh, Anusha Ansari and um, uh, Richard amazing. Marriott, uh, yeah. um, you know, they, they went up and they actually spent considerable extra money on their, uh, on their dime to uh, conduct science, to do educational outreach. So um, it, 
of course, it was a, a life-changing experience for them. They, they spent a lot of money to to just be there and to experience it. But they they made good on on the, those experiences as well. They they did valuable science, and so I salute them for that. And they became good PR mechanisms for the space industry itself too. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So I, I like this idea of what you said. The first thing you did is you unbuckled and you started taking pictures. And that is that kind of where the, the sky below, which is the title of your book, because literally it's the sky. You're looking, you're above yeah. the sky. That's right. It, yeah. it, it's it's got to be a heavenly type feel. It, it, it's, a, it's an out-of-body experience. Yeah, it's, it's a God's eye view. And, um, you know, I've had a good fortune to, uh, to have a number of these uh, uh, you know, life-changing experiences, viewpoints that many people don't have from the top of Mount Everest, uh, from high-flying jets, even, you know, uh, as a diver or uh, piloting submersibles, which is another thing that I've had a, a good fortune to do. Um, you look down in the water column and you feel like you're, you're looking down as if you're from the sky, looking down at the bottom of the ocean. And, you know, what's down there? And, and uh, you know, what are we going to discover this time? And uh, there's a sense of wonder that it gives you. Um, and so that, that's how I kind of focused on that as the title of my book. Uh, Richard, why don't you unmute yourself and ask a question? Go for it, Richard. Hey, Richard. Uh, hi, Scott. How are you? Thank you very you? much. Um, you I got my Apollo 11 plaque up here behind me. I'm a big fan of uh, the space program. I've had my uh, uh, weekend on the uh, aircraft carrier Carl Vinson through the Distinguished Visitor Program, did a tail hook landing and a catapult launch and that was nice. incredible and uh, watch those guys at work what do you think about the future um, with the military getting more involved through um, governments into uh, space yeah great question Richard and um, you know I, I guess I would say uh, you know the military has been involved in space from the very very beginning you know from 1958 and or uh, yeah the Sputnik and uh, you know, the dawn of the space age, the creation of NACA, which became NASA. Um, you know, the, the initial focus of NASA was the peaceful uses of space, and it was a civilian organization. But alongside of it, um, you know, there's always a military application and uh, of space, and, and it had been run by the Air Force, uh, the Air Force Space Command in uh, uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado, and it's, it's where all the tracking systems are where they manage the, the fleet of you know, military satellites that are up there. So uh, yes, we have a space force now. Um, I think we always had a space force. It just had been going by a different name and you know, it's been sort of a, a PR uh, initiative to, to create a new branch of the, of the military. Um, but I would love to see uh, us to continue to really focus on the civilian you know, positive uh, uses of space and, and to collaborate in space rather than to use it as as a next battleground. Um, huh. And that may be a little naive because we've already had anti-satellite tests. They've, yeah. well, I think even the United States has destroyed satellites, but China more recently uh, blew up a satellite, created this huge, uh, you know, um, spall pattern of, uh, you know, debris that, you know, knocked out other satellites. So it's a... Yeah, but this goes back to Reagan, SDI. I mean... Oh, absolutely. This, yeah, oh, this, yeah. is, this yeah. has been a plan for everybody for the longest time. You bet. And, and now it, it's the it, within the, the reach of, you know, what we would call rogue nations. But, you know, uh, Iran and North Korea, they can launch rockets just like we can. It's, you know, you can open up a copy of Aviation Week and uh, you'll get blueprints for, you know, rockets that'll get you to orbit. So, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's no longer the, the higher ground of, uh, you know, very advanced uh, first world nations. It's available to everybody. You know, Scott, so let's, you know, obviously one of the biggest problems is space debris, space garbage that's out there. And I, 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 I was down in Fort Huachuca, down in Arizona, and uh, there is a task force there, and all they do, like NORAD, is they monitor the space debris, they, right. that tracking system down there. And I was shocked to realize that everything is tracked, even down to the smallest little bolt that's floating around. To get the proper telemetry to get into space, it's gotten harder and harder and harder because of all the space debris. 
How do we solve that problem? It's a huge, huge problem. And, and actually, there, there is a threshold below which we can't track. So I think the, the current threshold is about uh, uh, one to two inches. So below that, um, you know, there, there are millions and millions of pieces of flexipaint washers from spent boosters, who knows what. Above that, you know, they are tracked, they're cataloged, and uh, we know they're, they're orbital track. And, and if we anticipate that the space station or your satellite that you just launched is going to have a conjunction, we will, you know, try and get it out of the way. But uh, the problem is if you're out on a spacewalk and, and you uh, have a thin spacesuit uh, and you've got a piece of debris coming at 25,000 miles an hour closing velocity, you're not going to win. Um, and so I no. think ultimately that's going to happen to spacewalkers and people in orbiting hotels and things like that, which is pretty frightening. Yeah. There's really no way to, to apply a vacuum cleaner uh, out in the vacuum of space. So people are looking at uh, directed energy, you know, ways to, to obliterate or to uh, create these enormous, uh, you know, fly swatters that could potentially pick up some debris, but it's a huge problem. I mean, it's an op it's, business opportunity too. If someone could figure a way to create a vacuum up there, and not just to track it, but to bring it down. Hey, did you say you uh, hiked to the summit of Mount Everest? Yeah. Yes, so, I've yeah, been on two expeditions. You've done two. So Mount Everest, as of course you know, is you hit a certain level to where you're dying as you are actually going up. And you then you have to go down and go up more and die much. more. Yeah. It's, <laughs> It's, it's one of the hardest things to ever do, obviously. Yeah. Or was being an astronaut harder? Well, uh, so they're, they're very different. You know, there's uh, the, um, I, I would tell you that the hardest thing about uh, be, being, becoming an astronaut is becoming an astronaut, uh, just the selection process. That I, I tell people all the time, I, I interviewed with, uh, with 22 amazing people Four of us in, in my interview cohort were selected, but any of the 22 that they had in this final group would have been amazing astronauts. So I was just fortunate enough to get picked. And there are a lot of smart people that could do the job. Um, but you know, the, the selection process is probably the hardest. Uh, physically and mentally, the hardest thing I've ever done is actually um, Everest. So it's the, yeah. the, the inner voice that's, you know, you're at uh, 28,000 feet, still have a long way to go and uh, you're, you're cold, you're hypoxic, uh, dehydrated, malnourished, and uh, you see some clouds on the horizon and you, you know, <laughs> there are all sorts of reasons why any sane person would turn around. But um, if you can kind of uh, get in the zone and, and control your breath, uh, take a sip of water, um, you know, look more carefully at the weather, you know, the, it's not a factor. Ultimately, you're, you're feeling pretty good, you can continue. And so, um, I, I think back on my Everest experience quite a bit, actually, whenever things get really tough for me, because I overcame a lot of, uh, uh, obstacles, both, you know, real physical ones, but also, um, you know, self induced, uh, you know, mental ones. But, so, but what, but one out of, is it one out of 15 people die on Everest? Maybe it's one, even one out of six or something like that. It might be narrower. It's, it's crazy. It's, uh, I believe it's about 2% of people who actually summit will, uh, will perish at, on the descent. Yes, 5,000 5, people have gone up and it's, it's littered with bodies. One yeah. of my closest friends, I'm not sure if you know who Allison Levine is. Um, yeah, her name. Uh -huh. oh, Allison, so she did it one and a half times. She got up to 100 feet to the top and a storm came in and she had to go down. Good for her. She, oh. she did the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. the reason I bring this up is, on an insurance writer, if you want life insurance or health insurance, one of the questions, of course, is are you a pilot? Are you doing anything that it's extraneous, like climbing a mountain? And right away, your premiums shoot up. Being an astronaut, your odds are even greater of dying. <laughs> Smaller group, more missions have obviously have not ended well. How do you get life insurance? How do you get health insurance? So I've had the same life insurance uh, since right before I became an astronaut. So oh, kept smart. The same policy. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, USA through my, uh, my dad. And uh, yeah, so I, I've kept that, uh, that same policy ever since. Smart. Because otherwise, man, it'd be a hard thing to get, my God. 
So, hey guys, ask questions. The chat is open. Dive into this. I'm going to, I could spend all day. It's not too often we get to hang out with a, or come on, an astronaut. I wanted to talk about the idea of when you're doing a spacewalk, you experience a few things. First is the idea of darkness. Oh, yeah. Because we can turn off the lights, but there's still some type of light, even if the lights are off there. Darkness is darkness. Can you talk about that? There, there's no way to create the intensity of, of blackness that you see, even in a star-filled sky and your, your eyes are dark accommodated, you know, your pupils will expand uh, or, or uh, increase in diameter with, with low light conditions. The, the, there's a character to it that uh, it's almost three-dimensional, but you, you can't create it in, uh, in film. You, you can't uh, create it even uh, in, uh, in your home, probably, you know, there, there are LEDs in a, a distant corner of the room that are probably creating enough light that you, you can perceive shape and things of that nature. Out there, it, it is just cold, dark, black, and uh, um, it's, does it it's feel, beautiful. Does it feel cold? Well, it, it can. Um, so when we go around the Earth in our orbits, uh, you know, several hundred miles up, we're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, half of which is in what we call orbital night behind the earth in shadow. And then half of it is in, uh, in direct sunlight. And so uh, we can be 300 degrees uh, above zero in direct sunlight and then behind the earth 200 degrees uh, below zero in one 90 minute period. And so uh, it depends on where you are and what you're touching at the time, but you, you can get really, really cold or you can get super, uh, super sweaty and really hot, uh, conversely. And you were, you were, you did what, 47, 48 hours on spacewalks? That's 47 hours on spacewalks. Yeah. So, uh, so seven space there, again, you're working, you're, you're not out there to voyeur, you are out there to work. So being in that work environment, did you get a chance to really appreciate what was going on or was it just work all the time? Thankfully, I have some just lifelong uh, etched memories uh, in my retina, and in my mind. So um, I, on one of my flights with uh, this Canadian, uh, Chris Hadfield, we did a couple of spacewalks to install the Canada arm to the space station. And I was waiting for Chris to finish up a task. And I had half an orbit, 45 minutes, just to hang on and wait for him to finish a task. And I, I saw our world pass beneath us. And it was just so spectacular. One of the things that I saw were the uh, the southern lights, so the aurora australis, and, and it's a curtain of light that uh, you know reaches up and uh, you know several hundred miles up, and we flew right through it, and uh, I was just floating there and just kind of absorbing every photon. Where was your iPhone to take pictures? <laughs> yeah, we didn't even have iPhones, and I think we had Palm Pilots, but um, <laughs> that was a while back. But uh, and then another amazing experience at my very last spacewalk of my career. Um, we're flying over Australia at night and we just finished this really epic uh, repair of a solar panel and I was flying back on this long uh, robotic arm and looking down on the whole space station space shuttle complex and over Australia and it must have been a, an enormous uh, lightning storm at night, maybe a thousand square miles and it was one burst of lightning and then at the tips of the fingers of each of the burst of lightning would be a node, so there would be another burst and a burst and a burst. It was like a like a fireworks show, wow, beneath me. And uh, it's a process called mesoscale lightning. And me and my buddy Wheels were the only two human beings to ever see that. But uh, you know, it's like wow, we oh. did you see that? That that just happened, you know. <laughs> that is so cool. Let's go after some questions. Jared, unmute yourself. Ask your question. Hey, Jared. Hey, first of all, thank you for doing this. Um, you bet. I do I have two questions, but my primary one that I'm really interested in is, I've heard it said many times that once you leave the atmosphere that you, there is a knowing or understanding of the reality of God. And if this is true, is this true in your case? And if so, uh, what is that experience like? God, I wish that were true for me. I mean, I would love to have, you know, found Nirvana or had, you know, kind of a, uh, an epiphany of, of that magnitude. It has happened to certain people. There was a, an Apollo astronaut, uh, Edgar Mitchell, who, uh, sadly left us uh, know, four or five years ago, but he actually had kind of a religious, uh, you know, experience. Um, 
uh, on his way back from the moon. Um, it, life-changing sort of a, an event for me. Um, I, I think what uh, the, the experiences have done for me is made me more appreciative of uh, this planet behind me here. Uh, but uh, the fragility of our, our planet and a desire to do something uh, in my life to, to benefit it, to try and you know, earn the oxygen that I breathe. So, um, yeah, I think everybody comes back at a minimum uh, an environmentalist of some sort. Um, and then there are those rare individuals who, you know, just, you know, it, it's a, a soul changing uh, kind of experience like you described. Great question, by the way, Jerry. Thank you very much. Hey, Z, you got the next question. Z, go for it. Unmute yourself. Ethan? Hey, how you doing? Hey. Thanks good. for coming, man. It's a pleasure listening to you talk about all this. I, I was my childhood dream to be an astronaut. Actually, that's the only thing I had in my head since I was about 11 years old. There's still um, time. Yeah. Let's go, man. <laughs> for almost the entire pro I, mean, I had to get to, I wanted to be a pilot. My dad worked huh? for Rock in the space shuttle. I sat in the space shuttle. And I wanted to be, I wanted to pilot the shuttle. And I learned that that was only Navy jet pilots at the time. So I, I aimed to be a Navy jet pilot. And I even got my nomination to the Naval Academy from a congressman and about to go, I had sworn in. And then they told me I would not fly. Oh, or glass. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> holy in my direction. I was like, I was kind of heartbroken. Like, all right, that's all I want to do since I was a kid. Yeah. So I didn't keep going to be an astronaut, but is that still the case? Is it still Navy jet pilots that are flying these, these spacecraft? No? No, and not at all. In fact, uh, um, uh, and there are, there are Air Force and Marine and uh, a couple of Army uh, folks who have had flying duties on board the space shuttle. Now it's actually opened up even further. So uh, if, if you saw any of the uh, uh, SpaceX uh, Dragon flight in, in recent months, uh, it's mostly an automated vehicle. And so they're, they're going to be flying uh, crews of four plus up to the International Space Station. And I believe they'll be using uh, uh, pilots who are not even military pilots. I'm, I'm a commercial pilot, but I didn't go through the military ranks, but I'd oh. be qualified to do it. Um, it's actually pretty interesting. I, I, I recommend you check it out. There's actually a simulation online where you can actually fly a rendezvous and docking with the International Space Station in the Dragon really? Capsule. Uh, so it's worth Googling, but. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you bet. Yeah. Yeah. Great question, Z. Let's go to Bart. Bart Baggett. Hey, Bart. Hey, buddy. Hey, Bart. hey, Scott. Thanks for sharing. I was wondering if you've seen the Netflix show called Space Force and, uh, <laughs> and whether you think, it's, you think it's funny or offensive. To be honest, when I watched it, I just thought it was a show. And then I went, this sounds kind of like reality, like with the Donald Trump. And what do you think about that? You find that amusing? I find it really hilarious. My wife didn't uh, like it very much. So this is really <laughs> my, my wife's a planetary scientist, and so she's a little, probably a little bit more literal than me. Uh, but, you know, I love uh, Jim Carroll and um, anything he does. But, yeah, it was a spoof, and I think it was meant to, uh, you know, kind of, you know, make poke fun at Space Force. Um, but, you know, as we know, our world is even crazier than, you know, um, what was the uh, – the, the Netflix show um, with Type Kevin King. Spacey, with oh. Kevin Spacey. Uh, oh, the, uh, Wait, the House, House, of House of Cards. House of Cards. Yes, I mean, we, we live in a world where, you know, our political system is even crazier than House of Cards now. So it's tough to kind of shock us with, you know, things like, you know, this show. So that's why Tiger King is the best thing ever. No. <laughs> All right. Bart, I actually like that question. Good one. Let me go to Harak. Harak, unmute yourself. You got it, buddy. Harak. Hey, how's it going? Uh, good, I'm good. outside, so you can't see my face, but uh, got a pretty cool gotta get, uh, gotta get end your of the exercise. sunset there. Yeah. Gotta get what? Gotta get your exercise. Go for it. We're all oh, doing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, um, I had two questions. Um, one of them was, what was the scariest experience that you ever had up in space and second is um do you dream and what do you dream about when you're sleeping in weightlessness oh interesting great stuff uh well um the the scariest thing for an astronaut a professional astronaut is screwing up because you know that your 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 colleagues are never going to let let you live it down you'll probably get a nickname out of it or what we call a call sign. So if you're terrified that you're gonna do, you really dork something up and 
and it's going to you know, mar the rest of your career, and and maybe you won't get a chance to fly again. So that that's the yeah. And I'm not I'm not just making that up to sound you know false bravado. It's just it really it is what is driving you. So the the thing that I was most frightened of my entire career was my last spacewalk when we had to repair this solar panel, and uh, all this work had been, gone into uh, getting us ready to go do this on the ground and. Uh, and at the final steps, it was my my activity to actually stitch it back to life, and and wow. I was really worried that you know I would you know lose one of the stitches or I would get electrocuted or you know something <laughs> uh, bad would happen and we wouldn't get the job done. And so that was really kind of uh, the way my head was was wired at the time. Um, dreaming in space is interesting. I I uh, unfortunately I'm not really good about memorizing. Yeah, recalling my uh, my dreams uh, um, and certainly up there I was um, I don't recall any specific dreams but it's interesting sleeping in space because you're you're actually floating inside your your uh, sleeping bag and so you, there's nothing contacting you other than you know every once in a while you bump up against your sleeping bag and uh, it's, it's kind of tough to fall asleep um, we're in a little bit higher radiation environment. And so there are these highly energized uh, uh, particles that will hit your retina. And it's like someone's flashing uh, a spotlight onto your retina. Um, and so if, if this happens while you're just oh, wow. trying to transition into sleep, I mean, you are up. I mean, it, it is just so so strange. It's called- well, That's interesting off. what you just said, Scott, about, about gravity, because do we need gravity for our organs to work properly? Does our stomach and our intestines need gravity for food to be processed properly? Well, it is a gravity assist system. So it's actually a lot easier to get things through your system here on earth. Uh, it takes about two or three days for the whole plumbing to start to work efficiently up in space. Um, so it, it works up in space, but um, it takes some adaptation. The thing that we don't really know whether or not it'll work is uh, the full reproductive cycle. So will a fetus in utero uh, fold and, and uh, wow. will organogenesis actually take place without a gravity vector? And that's a big unknown. You know, can we actually live in, in space forever? Maybe not. We might look a whole lot different as humans. So let, let's finish with Harak's question. What was yeah. the scariest thing that happened? Well, yeah, I, I was gonna actually wrap back to, to dreaming. Um, so, he was asking about uh, you know dreams in space, and you know I don't really have any recollection. But what's really cool about coming back from space, uh, I would I would have these vivid dreams of still being up in space. I would wake up and and think that I'm still up in space, and and think okay, I could just kind of float out of my sleeping bag. Oh no, nope, I've got a gravity vector here. I'm, I'm going to crash, you know, you know, uh, crack my skull if I, <laughs> you know. You know, jump out of bed here, but uh, so you're always sleeping with one eye open, huh? Or I mean, can you get more than an hour of sleep at a time? You can. Um, what's interesting though, Harad, is that you your physical workload, like you're out on a walk, you're you're resisting gravity. Your muscles and bones are are working against gravity. Your heart muscle is pumping against gravity. So your whole body is uh, is you know working in developing a need for rest. But up in space, it's like being on holiday. Um, it's like, you know, being on a float on top of a, a pool and uh, you just push off with your fingertips to, to move about where you want to go. So your, your physical exhaustion at, at the end of the day, unless you've done a spacewalk, is pretty limited. And you also have a lot of adrenaline, a lot of, you know, excitement for being there. So I would find that I only needed about four or five hours of sleep at night. And but so does, your body go through, does your body go through atrophy then? Yes, uh, to a degree, although we would exercise about an hour a day on a bike ergometer, which is reasonably, you know, okay for the heart muscle, but it wasn't anything to kind of preserve your, your postural musculoskeletal system. So like when Chris Hatfield is up there for that long period of time, he must have felt so uncomfortable in a gravity environment then. It's, it's hard on the body. You know, you know what Chris had was... Uh, Another exercise device called the resistive exercise device, or RED, NASA loves acronyms, but uh, it's a hydraulic uh, 
driven system where you can actually do squats and bench presses and curls and whatever else you want to do. So they try and uh, create um, a physical workload on your body such that you know, when you land back in gravity, you're not going to be uh, you know, a cup of jello. You, no. you, you'll be able to lift your own body weight, but it does take about uh, two or three months of physical uh, therapy uh, to kind of get back into your, your prior routine. Wow. That's amazing. Okay, let's go to her, uh, Akira. Akira, unmute yourself. Go for it, buddy. Hey, guys. Hey, hey. Scott. Thank you. This is, I love the way you talk about all this stuff. It's just so easy to understand. And I'm someone who is really excited and interested in space, but uh, knows little about it. But I grew up watching the Challenger missions and the right, Apollo right. missions and stuff. And I had a question about just kind of the, the future outlook with exploration, it seems to me that private space flight and the entrepreneurs that we, we see launching rockets, you know, every month um, uh, are making it more popular and, and advancing it a lot. But it seems to me there's almost maybe two camps. It seems like there's the moon people and then the Mars people. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just curious, what, what, what does the moon hold exploring the moon hold in our future versus Mars? Because it seems like the moon is more nostalgic. It was something that was a milestone, great for education, but is it part of the future of space exploration? Yeah, no, that, that's a really insightful question, uh, Karen. And, and I would say that um, I would love to be able to say, we're ready to go to Mars today and let's, let's gas, gas up and go. But the problem is uh, it's a very committing Voyage, you know, with conventional chemical rockets like uh, Elon is uh, Musk is building right now, it takes about nine months to get there, six to nine months, depending on on where the alignment of the planets are, and then you might have to spend up to two years there uh, before the planets kind of realign for you to come back home. So, before we really commit to leaving the planet for good, it'd be really nice to make sure that the habitats, the spacesuits, the uh, technologies to live off the land, to be able to harvest. Uh, frozen water ice from the soil and, and from the rocks nearby to build the shelters with a proper radiation protection. But we knew how to do that really, really well before we, we set sail for Mars. And so that's really the, the rationale for doing a, an outpost on the South Pole of the moon first. Um, we can get back in three days if, if all hell breaks loose, you know, and, and uh, we're, we're smarter for it. But if we send a crew to Mars, yeah, it could be a, a one-way you know, death sentence. It would be a pretty unbearable kind of a thing. So um, as much as I, I would love to see us you know, set sail for, uh, for Mars right away, um, I also think that we have a lot more that we can learn from our nearest neighbor. You know, it, it's, it, it has the geologic history of bombardment from you know, the, the formation stages of our own planet. So, what can we learn about you know, how the Earth formed and can we use the far side of the moon as a, a platform for radio telescopes to look back into the beginnings of time, to look at the Big Bang? Um, I think there are a lot of things that we, we didn't do as part of Apollo. We, we put six flags there and we did good science. Uh, <laughs> and we won the Cold War, but there's a lot more that I think the moon can teach us. That's why we got to go back to the 1970 show, Space 1999 with Martin Landau and Barbara Bain and watch what they're doing. I think the biggest, Akira, just to answer something that's really, really important, the next billionaires, or let's call them trillionaires, will learn to mine for helium-3, which is on the moon, which yep. is probably one of the most powerful energy sources you could ever imagine. But um, it's, it's on comets in the moon. That's where it is. But, yep. and I know you know that, Scott, but helium-3 is something that's super important, which we have none on the Earth, basically. But the moon has it. I want to go to... AJ, oh, no, I'm going to go to Matt. Matt, you got the next question. Uh, Matt. Go for it, Matt. Matt, while you're cooking, I think you have your apron on. <laughs> what are we having? Yeah, Matt, I do have my I do have my apron on. I'm, I'm mostly salad, a little <laughs> bit of uh, a little bit of, of, of fish, and <laughs> um, I don't know what what did I ask? What was my question? It's not a problem. Then you said Space Force. The show has a trademark. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so Space Force, the show, has a trademark which um, um, preempted the United States government and, and uh, um, I know you don't like to talk about politics, Donald Trump from having a trademark on 
Space Force. What do you think about that? What do you think about a show having a, a trademark that um, preempts, pre preempts um, anything else? Well, yeah, I, I had not heard that. Uh, <laughs> that that's really, that's hilarious. Uh, um, I, I think that's, uh, I'm gonna have to study up on that, but uh, um, I don't have a, a strong opinion one way or another. I, I'm not really crazy about the, the name Space Force. It, it sounds, Kind of 1950s, uh, if you ask me. But uh, yeah, I, I think they probably could have come up with a, a different name. That the original name was actually Space Command, uh, the Air Force Space Command, which actually sounds pretty good to me. I would, I might have kept it. But again, yeah. Martin Landau would be part of that. That okay. sounds right. Thank Thanks, you. Matt. I'm going to do last question. Last questions coming from our rock star, AJ Jackson. By the way, if you don't know who AJ is, you want to go listen to Saint Motel. Saint Motel, AJ. Got AJ, it. one of the best bands out there. And our music, AJ, you got the last played, question. Uh, we, we, we had our music played on Mars, which was a big honor. That was really cool. I guess oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh -huh. But Scott, always, always a pleasure and an honor to listen to an astronaut speak. And, you know, good amazing. to meet you, AJ. Um, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts. Uh, Akira kind of brought this up a little bit, and you were talking about Mars mission. But on terraforming Mars, um, you know, are, are you seeing that as something that is maybe – a goal? I'm, I'm really excited about uh, Earth 2.0. You know, I, I think hopefully we can do a better job uh, when, when we go someplace else, if we kind of set some rules of engagement and, and try and do it right uh, next time. But um, the, the, the concept of uh, you know, terraforming is, is very exciting. You know, there's incredible amounts of water on Mars, Olympus Mons and, and elsewhere in the permafrost. Uh, the problem is it takes a lot of energy uh, to, to release that. And so um, the conventional thought is that it would take perhaps as much as 10,000 years of, of directed energy and, and deliberative effort to actually kind of create a breathable uh, environment on Mars, um, which is a long time. Um, the sad part about when we do initially colonize Mars, and I think Elon and hopefully NASA and Blue Origin and all these groups are going to collaborate together to make that happen. Um, the crews that go there, the first inhabitants are going to have to live underground. You know, it's a, it's got a low um, magnetic field. It doesn't have a, a dipole like the earth does. So it's susceptible to galactic cosmic radiation and, and uh, solar uh, mass ejection. So there's a lot of radiation that strikes the planet and would be a risk for cancer. So they're gonna have to create a lot of shielding by burying their habitat which, you know, if you think, you know, we're going all this way to Mars, I, I want to, you know, live on the land and s see the vistas and everything, but they're going to have to kind of hide out and, and just come out for short periods of time. But uh, um, I would love to see that. And I think, um, you know, you know, terraforming certainly is possible and maybe with modern technologies, we could, we could accelerate that. Um, somebody quoted, uh, well, we'll just take some nukes and, and we'll just, uh, you know, do a lot of thermonuclear detonations and we'll create a radioactive uh, atmosphere, which seems to defeat the purpose too. So I don't know. <laughs> so to, to end this properly first, how can we help you with your business? You got an incredible group of doers here. We have all kinds of resources from financial to incredible contacts. How can we help you out, Scott? Well, that, that's so kind of you, uh, Sir Ken. I, I appreciate it. I'm going to call you Sir Ken for the rest of your life. You realize that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, um, yeah, so I know you guys have amazing Rolodexes and, and it, business is all about, you know, uh, connections and who you know and getting the right introduction at the right time. But what I'm trying to do is uh, revolutionize um, uh, the conversion of human intent into, uh, into action. And so... What I really want to do more than anything is, is leverage the technology I described for you uh, to be able to deliver surgical, uh, teleoperate surgical robots in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, oh, okay. To be able to uh, um, you know, make uh, virtual augmented reality um, accessible to everyone so that, you know, whether it's uh, in a social interaction where you know, we, we all go into a, you know, a, a common environment and we can move around and interact. Um, my technology can help us do that. Um, 
to be able to uh, to leverage the technologies that we have now. I mean, we're we're sort of in the the Jetsons era of these, you know, um, urban air mobility, you know, flying cars. And you know, I think my, my control systems will one day uh, make that possible for everyone, even you know, your five year old kid, to be able to to fly these things safely and and without hurting anybody. So I'm, I'm, if anyone knows anyone who gets excited about those kinds you, of things. Do you know I'm, who Mick Ebeling is from Not Impossible Labs? No, I do not. Okay, so Mick Ebeling is somebody you, you want to look at Not Impossible Labs. Uh, Not Impossible. Somebody uh, you want to look into and uh, he's, he's part of our community. Uh -huh. um, so we can help you out with that. And yeah. of course you're connected with Peter Diamantis and Ray Kurzweil and Daniel Kraft, who's part of our group, mm -hmm. who's a, a class act. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Couple of things. I'll hook you up with Nolan Bushnell because you wanted to meet Nolan, who would be great to probably even have as your board of advisors because the guy that created Atari is pretty damn cool. Yeah, yeah. And then another question is, are you doing speaking gigs? I do, uh, although you know, this is such a crazy time. Uh, I, so uh, backing up just a little bit, um, I, I was taking a startup CEO salary for you know, the first two years of my company. And the, re the way I was able to keep uh, you know, food on the table and pay the mortgage was through uh, public speaking. So I, I was doing a lot of that, but the pandemic has kind of shut that industry down, I think. But well, I'm organizing an event in Dubai the second week of December. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, it's called Jitex, and oh. uh, they are interested in you. <laughs> okay, cool. So, and that's cool. an on-location event, which, by the way, there's a lot of money in Dubai. Just a thought. Yes, just a thought. Right. <laughs> So I'll get a hold of you tomorrow. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Scott, thank you so much for sharing time with us. Guys, will you please all unmute yourself and thank Scott for being part of the metal community today. Please. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much, Scott. 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 Appreciate thank you. you. So much. We'll see you Amazing. later. Amazing. You. You're Bye, a hero. Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.